This is from the ODT today. COVID at the highest level in 18 months. Hospitalizations are rising. New Zealand has experienced its highest peak in COVID-19 cases since December 2022. Last week, the ministry report reported, now reported probably is very different from how many there were. We all know people aren't necessarily reporting as much these days, but reported over 6,000 new cases of the virus and uh, 19 deaths. That was a substantial increase on the number of cases reported the previous week, which was 3,900. The data came from wastewater testing. Uh, this is what Professor Baker said. But hospitalizations were also up. We were, uh, we're up to about 35 a day going to hospital with this infection. So because it's a, a COVID conversation, because, you know, a couple of morons here don't really have all the information, we thought we'd get the expert on. So we haven't talked to Anna Brooks for a while, but let's uh, welcome back to the show from the University of Auckland, Dr. Anna Brooks. Anna, thank you so much for coming back and saying good day to us. Thanks for having me. Um, not to necessarily go, let's push replay on all those conversations we've had in the past. It does feel a bit like uh, what do we need to know, if anything, is there anything new we need to know about this latest COVID-19 um, increase and the projections that we've got this wave coming? Well, yeah, it's, it is a little bit of rinse and repeat of messaging, but the key message being that it's still here, right? Yeah. So, yeah. and I mean, the greatest numbers since, what was it, December 2022? Yeah, so it's ago. Yeah, so it's distinctive, right? So... Yeah, as, as the news item said, that it's an extrapolation or an estimation based on wastewater. So, you know, that's what all we've got now because yeah. we're not testing. Yeah. So it's that whole, we're in that phase now where COVID is still here, it's still causing deaths, it is still causing disease, it is still causing problems, so on and so forth. And we, we can't wish it to go away. We can't just ignore it to make it go away. And sadly, globally, it is, that is what's seeming to happen. Because the more we don't talk about it, the more people doesn't, don't think it's there. So, yes, it is significant. And the, the other sort of significant part of what's going on now um, is, is, how, is when we track New Zealand's pattern, I think is sort of the significant thing here. So, you know, you can have a look at, you know, the, the trace from since records began. And, you know, we had that phenomenal Omicron, Omicron peak. And we've never had something so, so substantial since, so thank goodness, right? Because that's when really the first wave came through. And yes, we've had waves since, but we've not had a sort of a giant spike. So I guess this is the headline sort of saying, okay, we're heading towards something a bit more substantial. And the, the other part of this sort of picture to sort of um, put into perspective is that normally we get, uh, you know, when there's a new variant that emerges, it's usually in our summer, which did happen like as in the JN.1 came over our summer. So when uh, the the other hemisphere has their winter, they're usually, uh, you know, battling them all. They're battling a new wave of the new, uh, a new variant and all the winter illnesses. So they get the significant wave. Yes, the new variant hits our country, but we, we you know, it's not a huge peak, right? So that pattern has happened the last two summers. The different thing that's happening now is we didn't sort of, peak and go, oh, look, nailed that. You know, we're, we're sitting pretty and uh, off we head towards winter. This, we've, COVID's been bubbling along and now we're sort of pre-winter and getting a spike. So what I've always said when I speak about the interesting trajectory of New Zealand is the, the one thing I've, I've always maintained. I, I'm never crystal balling, right? I always say, I don't know what's coming next. In the same way, I reflect and say, look at our traces. We seem to be doing not so badly, like mm. in case numbers. So what I'm now seeing and, and then so, so-called uh, sort of saying well, it's changing is that we are seeing these cases increase. And so what I've always maintained is we don't know how we'll fare in the winter. And that's starting to play out. So if we're starting to head up now, we so too could start to get the other winter bugs uh, kicking in earlier. And so what it could mean, and, I, and I'm always saying could because I don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, it could mean that, you know, everything hits harder because we've got it COVID peaking or starting to traject up now. And yeah. is that going to keep going? Are we going to get hit with more variants and so on? So it is a different picture than some of the patterns we've seen before. And especially... 
if you know if we haven't had it this high since you know over a year ago so it's it's all about the same messaging and and not none of this sort of pretending it's gone or why are we still talking about that didn't that go I, isn't that finished it's like no this virus is going to continue to cause havoc and it'll cause more ha havoc the more we try and ignore it so coupled in with all of that is the fact that we need to maintain public health messaging you know we need to not be afraid of hearing that COVID's out there and um protecting ourselves and all the, the rest of it because layered upon that is you know those that might be listening might say or might not have thought about it are like oh it's heading to winter gosh COVID's everywhere I might go get my vaccine so the other part of all this is that if everyone forgets about COVID and you might get sick and you're like, ah, oh, this is probably COVID or, you know, you're, you're ignoring it and you might not bother to take a test. So you don't even know when you last had COVID because, you know, the recommendations even with vaccination is to wait six months since your infection. So it's kind yeah. of like we all now have our own responsibility to, uh, you know, to not pretend this virus is gone. And that includes testing um, because we luckily still have access to these tools. Um, overseas, you know, it, you're hard pushed to find them and you pay for them, right? So right. those are the sorts of messages that I just wish were still going, right? Like as in this is this is still out there. It is still killing people. And we will start, we will continue to see long-term health harms. And that's the thing. It's it's not like we've peaked and it'll only just bumble along. No. The the other message I keep saying about New Zealand is are we just a few waves behind what we have seen overseas? And Again, no crystal ball here. If, if it's just about how many waves hit our country, it could just be a matter of time. And we know what could happen and we're blatantly ignoring it. There's my rant. Uh, oh, yeah, nice. Good rant. You can, you can wear a, the chewy rant of the week. You can win that award so far. Um, I'm interested because you just talked about the measures overseas. They're paying for them, et cetera. <laughs> this government has given us the free you know, yeah. boosters and stuff, or sorry, rats until the June the 30th. Is there, if, if you are able to answer this question, you may yeah. not be able to because of yeah. your position, but is there any talk amongst your peers, and I guess I'm talking about those in the realms of science who are doing stuff mm -hmm. in and around COVID, of concern as to how this government's going to handle it versus how it was handled? Mm. Well, of course. Like, as in, the more it's not spoken about, the more concern we get. And not speaking about it indicates you're not going to do anything about it, right? Like as in, we need to hear what's happening. And mm. to me, it, it won't be surprising if, yes, all of these things that we follow the rest of the world and cut funding and all the rest of it. it it's alarming, but, you know, it's, it is alarming. And to say that we're prepared for pandemics and all the rest, you know, we're not. We, we're in a situation where it feels like we are not putting into place what we should be putting into place. Um, so, but, you know, as I say, a lot of this is a global problem. It's not that it's just us. Um, it's just the crazy thing is, is out there on the other side of the world, everyone still thinks New Zealand's wonderfully doing well. <laughs> like, and it's, and I'm like, um, excuse me? So, so you know, internationally we're riding that wave um, and it's kind of frustrating to hear, especially on behalf of those suffering so badly here. You know mm. what I mean? Like as in when we know how much suffering this current pandemic that we call over, people are suffering, people are not getting support. There's no government support. There are no clinical pathways. You know, there, there's no, no there, you know, zero ticks across all of the things that should be being done. And globally, people don't realize that this is the situation we're in. So. Mm. Um, and it, it's not going to go away. And that's layered upon, you know, the, the health system uh, strains as it is, you know. Like we always, it, it's really frustrating being, you know, the speaker outer is, if you like, because it sounds like we're just sort of, you know, oh, spend more money. Generally speaking, preventative measures are far better, money well spent than trying to uh, treat a disease that's, that, is chronic or has no cure for and all the rest of it, you know, all of those things that compound when we do nothing um, cost far more money in the long run, right? So it's a, it's a, it's preventative measures are always better for our economy and, and all the rest of it. So so that's the thing. Yes, 
Some people, I'm sure, get sick of these messages, but we're trying to prevent the long-term harms because the data doesn't lie. And yeah. just because we're not tracking it doesn't mean it's not getting tracked in other countries and the absolute dire outcomes of, uh, you know, people plummeting or dropping out of the workforce. And yes, teachers and healthcare workers are top of the list. I've not been able to return to work, as we know, as has hit our headlines in schools. That was no surprise to me, and it's going to continue because the messaging around schooling and that um, that this complete blind spot, that the lack of attendance in school, if you don't say the word illness, um, what? Like, if you're not considering illness as a reason for, you know, attendance problems, then what rock are you living under is kind of the scenario here because – Look at all let's, that have a, hey, let, let's just have a look at this. Sorry, Chira, I was going to throw it to you now, but just because you've just no, no, mentioned, no, it, it. mentioned it, Anna, this was Q and A in the weekend. This clip's only like forty seconds, but because you're speaking to teachers, um, mm. so Jack Tame points out that as you've just said, teachers are at the top of the list for catching COVID, also long COVID. And just mm. all of us listen to uh, Erica Stanford's response to that. Remember, occupation safety and health means that government says you have a, 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 a standard of care, a, a due diligence to keep your workers healthy. Like if a, if a factory floor was um, causing people to be sick because of something like asbestos, that would be off the charts, you know, legal issues and complications here. This is what Erica yep. Stanford said in the weekend uh, when Jack Tame asked her um, about why are teachers at the top of this list. A 2022 Ministry of, da uh, Ministry of Health data found teachers have the highest self-reported cases of COVID infection of any profession. Otago University researchers found teachers are the most susceptible when it comes to professions for long COVID. Why do you think mm. that is? Well, because they're surrounded by sick kids, I guess. I mean, that's the, yeah. the, the key, right? And so we've... we've the ministry that, that's all I need to show you. Just like, why are they... Why are they why do they get COVID? Well, because they were surrounded by sick kids. Later in that interview, which we'll look at later on, Shui, um, Jack Tame challenges her. So your your I'm using my words now, your big swinging dick where you're going, Oh, we're gonna get more kids back at school. How is that gonna conflict with these teachers getting sick based on COVID? So Anna, happy for you to speak to that. Oh, it, it's it, it's just as I say, a blind spot. If, what force sick kids to go to school so that there's more illness at school so there's more sick teachers for bums on seats um it doesn't work like that you know sick kids staying home keeps more kids in school like like where's where's the logic lack of logic here right yeah. and if you stop and ask the question about you know what is causing low attendance and all the rest of it or or all of the issues that are impacting the education system and you're not asking about illness, you're not doing your job, right? Like as in you're not asking all the questions. You're, you're missing data. You're missing data. So, so yeah, so it's it's a bizarre scenario that, and, and, and I say this um, also off the back of what's happening elsewhere, like in other countries, right? Because it's the same message. Um, it's the same message. There's some outrageous messaging happening in the UK. Can't remember where it was, but it was almost like a comedy skit. It was that bad. Like as in, is this actual reality what's been educated publicly? And it was about saying, of course your kid can go to school. Look, they've only got a sniffle. And it was just like, how are we here? When there are measures that can be done, the, or you know, the, the constant messaging about ventilation and all of those things. Because let's not just forget, you know, like, Yes, okay, there's acute illness, you know, sniffing, coughing and feeling horrible and all of that, you know, which then spreads in the classroom. But even let's say you've recovered and you're back and you're not really recovered, right, because it's COVID and you may have a lingering time to recover. And, and I'm not talking about the actual chronic illness. I'm just talking about recovering in a sort of a normal sense. Yeah. You, you might have a delayed recovery where you can't even function at school because you have the impacts on uh, your, you know, the brain foggy, so, you know, basically just a long tail of recovery. And then laid on top of that, of course, the long COVID uh, problems as well. And the reason why teachers, school teachers are so high risk is because we know that the more times you're exposed, the more chance is that you will get long term impacts. And it's not, it's not sort of a complete sort of upward climb, right? You know, count how many infections. It's just that we never know, like as in any single one time when you're exposed, today might be your the day that you're at peak risk.
because we can't track and we don't know why today you're at risk, right? Mm. And so what we do know, the way to limit, you know, any particular time that you're most at risk is limiting infections. So yes, you know, we, we hear constantly of infection seven, infection eight, all of this happening in the UK and it's not doing anyone any good, you know, with, with constant re-exposures like that. And those that are chronically sick too, like what about, you know, um, vulnerable children? Does Do we have a head count on how many children in our education system are considered vulnerable? And therefore, has anyone asked us if, if that's why? There's a reason why attendance may be down for some families. It's not just the child, but what about the family unit? If that infection could impact the family unit, that could be a reason to, you know, not have your children at school as well. There are loads of reasons and everyone is just kind of polarising or, or blind spotting the fact that this virus doesn't exist, as yeah. if it's just any old infection and we should just move on. And sadly, that is not the case. Um, so all of these things are never part of the conversation, all the data, all the questions when we're asking about, uh, you know, situations of, of education systems, whether it's the children, the teachers and so on. So it requires policy. And as you just described, workplaces, uh, you know, are required, to, you know, to not expose us to risk. So, yeah. you know, if we know mm. there's a risk, it's a high risk job, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But they should start getting paid danger money like some jobs do. Chewy, what you got, sir? Um, so I love Erica's comment, and it just goes to a point that I've made a couple of times over the last couple of months. This government's actually really good at identifying problems. It sees them, uh, and then it just goes <laughs> fucking bananas on what to do about it. And and I, I think the other thing that we're going to fall into here is, you know, Ardern's government, uh, when COVID came along, they took advice from experts and they formed their policy on that. And we have seen this government's reaction to hearing from experts and its dismissal or outright ignoring them um, to come up with what they want to do. And I think mm. when we when we look at the initial outbreak and pandemic and that sort of thing, it was the absolute gold standard of communicating to as many people as possible what needed to happen, where we stood, um, you know, and I'm not suggesting a return to the, the, the you know, the 1 p.m. briefings or anything like yeah. that, but, you know, people in the chat, did you <laughs> hear that there was a big uptick in COVID? If so, where? Are you finding out now from us? <laughs> you know, um, that is a, big change of gears yeah uh yeah. And, and i think really just illustrates a point when people say hey look it doesn't matter who's the government they're all the same they aren't and they mm. aren't when it counts mm. <laughs> yeah and, and it just shouldn't be something that's taboo like we just have to now expect that there's illness around it's not a taboo subject you know like we we do we talk about when car accidents suddenly go through the roof or you know we have a weather event or the sun is burning more, you know, all of those health measures to do with weather, sun, seatbelts, all those sorts of things, they're just part of messaging. And so, like, what is wrong with having respiratory awareness, respiratory illness awareness as part of messaging? And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the thing that's really frustrating for, you know, the vulnerable people of our society is they're just locked out of society now, like completely. Like, there is no part of society they're safe, like nowhere. They can't even go to a hospital because they're like, wow, these healthcare workers don't even wear masks. Mm. It, there's respiratory infections everywhere. And, like, don't even get me started on that pathway. Like, some of the, well, like, if you're on a, you know, a high vulnerable ward, you know, everyone's got uh, a condition where the virus can kill you. How is it not mandatory? To not, you know, to wear a mask under that setting. So we are here, sadly. We are back to, you know, ground zero and trying to pretend this virus is not here. Um, and it, it's hard. We're sort of hard pushed to find anywhere actually doing the right thing. I think is part of the problem um, because you, 
you ask the average person, you know, if they know what's going on with COVID, you know, like you only really know what's going on if there is a headline and you happen to hear it or you're a prolific news reader, right? Other than that. What even me, even me is I just, I just came, I just happened to be, and I don't actually, I don't often check ODT. Yeah. I was looking for stories today and I just happened to check it today and I just happened to see it. To be frank with you, if I hadn't seen that headline on ODT, I, I know, and I'm a news junkie, I don't think I would have yeah. heard about it. No, and that's the thing because it's very low, um, low tier now because it's that oh that thing that we don't want to talk about. It's Absolutely. Fatigue. So fatigue and that's, talking about COVID. Pardon? Oh, it's just the fatigue, you know. People yeah, have put absolutely. up with it for years, and they but don't want to hear about it anymore. Yeah, yeah but it's all, it's also such a political hot pocket, hot ball. Yeah. You know that that the last guys, the guys who we got in now, in part, got in pointing to Labor and saying, "Look how they handled COVID at the end. Labor bad mandates, locked people up, people lost jobs." So, like, who's expecting this lot to go? Okay, it's, let, let's say it goes up by another thirty percent. You know, do we really expect these guys to then go, okay, we need to take some public health measures, you know, something like that to help people. And the people in the chat right now going, COVID's on the rise, who cares? It's like, yeah, but as you said, the vulnerable get locked out, the elderly still die, and people get long COVID. My, my last question to you, Anna, was going to actually be that. You sort of have been New Zealand's preeminent expert into researching and looking into long COVID. Now that we are a long way down the road from 2020, well, you know, for four years down the road from 2020. Yeah. Um, what what do we now know that perhaps we didn't know in the early stages of you doing your research around long COVID, if anything? We know heaps. We know enough to be raising the alarm that it is not a flu. It is this virus wow. is causing havoc, and it's causing havoc like at a high you know a high percent than a teeny tiny number. You know what I mean? Because it's spreading everywhere. So, you know, the, the more we learn, like put it this way, every time research comes out, it's not it's not reassuring re research, right? It's not like, oh, great. It's not as bad as we thought. No, it is, it, we're learning more and more and more about why the public deserve to know that people are vulnerable. The, the, the big sort of black boxes, or, you know, the, I mean, there's, ton, there's tons, she says, we don't know. But the things that we, you know, really don't know is, why one of us is at risk and someone else isn't yeah and you know is your risk factor to do with how many exposures or is it to do with your immune system is it to do with the day of the week like you know like there's so many variables as to as the risks and because of that because we can't tell you whether you're at risk or not whether you've had it no times or you've had it five times we can't tell you you're not at risk from a long-term health consequence like that is the absolute like solid part of what we do know is that we can't tell you if you're at risk or not because yes we know that uh you know repeated infections can lead to long-term harms we know that one infection can cause harm we know that a, a, an infection that barely touched the side you didn't even notice you could drop dead from a from a complication you didn't know you had so all of those things are very real and so all we can do with that information is educate. It is not scaremongering because, you know, what are we going to do in five years' time when people say, why don't, weren't we warned? It's like, mm, no, no, we've been warning. Um, and, and we're not in any way sort of talking about, you know, grand measures of pandemic scale, lockdown-y stuff. It's like if we could make, you know, and put measures in place to mitigate, you know, this constant risk that – that's, you know, a first place to start. Like, let's admit that this virus is causing problems, right? So, and yeah, from a biological, you know, there, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of research that we that we now know. And yes, it impacts children. Like, that was another big fast. You know, first of all, we got, oh, kids don't spread it. Yeah, that was a good one. Oh, schools are safe. They don't spread it there. Sure, another, you know, all the layers of information that were just completely untrue and we now know that you know schools are the biggest spreaders because of course you all congregate at school and then you spread yeah, to all of those families sense. when you go home right and it's not rocket science because there's not many families that haven't had this happen so this is where we're coming from for example if schools were the safest place you'd probably eliminate some of these waves right if schools were safe because that's that common ground where, you know, if you've got 30 little humans, that's 30 homes or whatever, you know what I mean? Like that 
alone mitigating you're not only protecting our young humans lives because we don't know the long-term impacts you know that i mean that should be top of the list really the priority should be protecting our youngest generations because we know it impacts the brain we know it impacts the vascular you know i could go on but essentially you know it's kind of like put some we need to put some effort in here we need to protect our vulnerable and as i say if, if it was the schools that we made safe with ventilation and you know lowering uh, infection risk it would have a massive impact community-wide because of that being such a high risk scenario already you know so yeah. Yeah, it's just, yes, we will always get the COVID here. Who cares? That, of course, of course. But, There's, you know, people who it, are locked at home because they can't go out because they're vulnerable, it, it doesn't, it, it's it's not, not reassuring to them, is it? Because we're just basically becoming an ableist globe. Um, there's a, I have this strange juxtaposition in, in me, Anna, because mm -hmm. uh, we love talking to you but we hate why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wouldn't it be so much better if we didn't need to talk to Anna? But when we do, we love talking to you. So thanks so much for joining us again tonight. It's been a while. You never know, you know, into course could be, you know, take this magic bullet to, you know, get rid of all illnesses. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, in saying that, we'll have you back anytime for any reason and we'll continue to do so. So thanks for joining us again tonight. Awesome. And hopefully some people out there have heard some words and maybe it's given them a wake up as well. Yeah. And, and you know, and thanks for bringing attention to it. Yeah, It's not going yeah. away, sadly. All right, Anna. We'll talk yeah. to you soon, eh? Awesome. Cheers, Anna. That's great.